While it's often tempting to think of the lung as a balloon or a blimp, a zeppelin turns out to be a much more useful analogy. Although all of these objects are gas-filled, just like a lung, a zeppelin most closely resembles a lung, since unlike the other two objects, it also contains an incredibly fine and intricate internal latticework, just like a lung. We refer to the internal latticework of a lung as its interstitium. If I were to draw a simplified representation of the lung, I'd choose to draw it like this. Whenever you encounter an abnormal lung opacity on a chest x-ray, think of four possible causes. Perhaps the gas in a region of the lung has been replaced by fluid. Perhaps the gas in an area of the lung has gone away and the area is focally deflated. Perhaps the fine latticework or interstitium of the lung has become thickened. Sometimes this thickening may occur regionally, and sometimes it may occur very focally. Or perhaps a solid lump has developed within the lung. The label we use for the first situation is consolidation. We label the second situation atelectasis when it's reversible, and scar or fibrosis when it's not reversible. We label the third situation as an interstitial opacity, and we label the fourth situation as a nodule or a mass, depending on whether it's smaller or larger than three centimeters. When consolidation is present in the lung on a chest x-ray, it may represent pulmonary edema from heart failure or capillary leak edema from injured capillary vessels in the lung. It may represent alveolar hemorrhage from injured or irritated blood vessels in the lung, or in the setting of a coagulopathy. Or, the consolidation may represent pneumonia. The customary appearance of consolidation on chest x-ray is a lung opacity with indistinct margins that is not associated with local lung shrinkage. While it tends to be easier to recognize or exclude local lung volume loss with large lung opacities, it can be really tough to do this with smaller lung opacities, which is when we tend to see radiologists hedge a lot between consolidation and atelectasis. Air bronchograms, where air-filled bronchi appear as dark tubular structures against a background of opaque whitish lung, and the silhouette sign, where opaque lung tissue of similar density to heart and mediastinum makes normal cardiomediastinal borders focally indistinguishable, are also features you may encounter with consolidation, but they're nonspecific since they also may occur in the setting of atelectasis or scar. Let's say you're comfortable labeling a particular lung opacity as consolidation. How do you decide then if pulmonary edema, alveolar hemorrhage, or lung infection is the most likely explanation? The distribution of the consolidation can provide a hint. While lung infections may occasionally present with a diffuse distribution of consolidation, and pulmonary edema may occasionally present with very non-diffuse distributions, Typically speaking, diffuse distributions of consolidation heavily favor pulmonary edema, and non-diffuse distributions of consolidation favor lung infection. Focal versus multifocal versus diffuse distributions of consolidation occur with relatively uniform regularity in cases of alveolar hemorrhage, though alveolar hemorrhage is a much less common diagnosis than pulmonary edema or lung infection which is why I've colored its bar on this table dimly and with no gradient. Here are a couple classic examples of consolidation in the setting of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, pneumonia, and alveolar hemorrhage. The evolution of consolidation 
over successive chest x-rays can provide you with a hint too. With pneumonia, consolidation usually progresses over days and also usually resolves gradually too. On the other hand, with pulmonary edema and alveolar hemorrhage, consolidation may appear quickly, sometimes over just a couple hours, and when treated, resolves relatively quickly too. Focal lung deflation happens when a central lung mass, mucus plug, or foreign body occludes a central airway and prevents gas replenishment, resulting in obstructive atelectasis, or when the presence of fluid or gas in the pleural space allows the lung parenchyma to recoil away from the chest wall and enter a tighter volume, or when the diaphragm is not pulling down as much as it should to keep the lung bases well inflated. Focal lung deflation may also happen when aspiration introduces gastric acid into the alveolar spaces, which impedes surfactant from lowering the surface tension along the inner surface of the alveoli and causing alveolar sacs to snap shut, resulting in adhesive atelectasis. Focal lung deflation may also occur when chronic infectious or inflammatory disorders in the lung or pleural space result in tissue injury that triggers excessive collagen deposition, which we recognize as SCAR, or cicatricial atelectasis due to SCAR. The customary appearance of focal lung deflation in the setting of obstructive atelectasis is probably the one we're able to most reliably recognize on chest x-rays, since it generally takes only one of five familiar patterns. A right upper lobar pattern, a right middle lobar pattern, a right lower lobar pattern, a left upper lobar pattern, and a left lower lobar pattern. It's also possible to relatively reliably recognize focal lung deflation in the setting of scar and cicatricial atelectasis, since these will often appear on chest x-ray as dense linear bands or wedge-shaped opacities with local architectural retraction, such as the linear cicatricial atelectatic bands in this patient with asbestos-related pleural disease, and the thick linear fibrotic bands in this patient with sarcoidosis. Our ability to recognize passive and adhesive atelectasis may sometimes be a bit less reliable, however. While these two forms of atelectasis may sometimes result in dense linear bands or wedge-shaped opacities near the lung bases, they can also sometimes result in smaller opacities than in obstructive atelectasis and less specific appearing opacities than in cicatricial atelectasis and scar. Since volume loss is tough to recognize or exclude in smaller lung opacities, it can be tough to distinguish consolidation from these two forms of atelectasis on chest x-rays. For example, with the heterogeneous sublobar lower left lung opacity on this image. Since passive and adhesive atelectasis occur relatively infrequently in the upper two-thirds of the lung, Sublobar lung opacities in the upper two-thirds of a lung will most likely represent consolidation. On the other hand, atelectasis and consolidation are both common causes of sublobar opacities in the lower third of the lung, which is why radiologists will often hedge with opacities in the lower lungs. There are three tips you can sometimes use in the lower lung, though. One, statistically speaking, in post-op and ICU patients, most lower lung opacities will be atelectasis and not consolidation. Two, in patients with a pleural effusion, passive atelectasis usually doesn't go any higher than the pleural meniscus. If it does, seriously consider consolidation. Number three, in patients with high aspiration risk, some folks will choose to interpret lower lung opacities under 48 hours old 
as, quote, adlectus and slash or aspiration pneumonitis, unquote, and lower lung opacities that are unchanged for over 48 hours as consolidation or pneumonia. Interstitial opacities occur when the fine latticework of the lung becomes thickened in either a regional or a very focal pattern due to irritation, inflammation, impaired fluid drainage, or the presence of cancer cells. The two regional patterns of interstitial thickening are a septal interstitial pattern and a reticular interstitial pattern. And the very focal pattern of interstitial thickening is better known as a nodular interstitial pattern. Nodular interstitial patterns have five different subtypes. The centrilobular, tree and bud, perilymphatic, bronchovascular, and random interstitial patterns. Each of the interstitial opacity patterns on this table are associated with a slightly different differential diagnosis. For example, a septal interstitial pattern most often occurs in the setting of pulmonary edema, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, or alveolar proteinosis. A reticular interstitial pattern most often occurs in the setting of usual interstitial pneumonia, of which some cases may be IPF, fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, sarcoidosis, and fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. A centrilobular interstitial pattern most often occurs in the setting of infectious bronchiolitis from a bacterial, viral, tubercular, or endemic fungal lung infection, non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or respiratory bronchiolitis in a smoker. A tree and bud interstitial pattern most often occurs in the setting of infectious bronchiolitis. A perilymphatic or bronchovascular interstitial pattern most often occur in the setting of sarcoidosis, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, and pneumoconiosis. And finally, a random or miliary interstitial pattern most often occurs in the setting of hematogenously disseminated TB, hematogenously disseminated endemic fungal infection, or hematogenously disseminated metastases. While we're pretty good at discerning all of these interstitial opacity patterns on a chest CT, we tend to have a much tougher time on chest x-rays because the three-dimensional anatomy of a lung is collapsed into a two-dimensional shadowgram. The centrilobular interstitial pattern, which is often a pretty indistinct one even on high-quality CT imaging, is usually invisible on a chest x-ray. And with everything being collapsed into a two-dimensional shadowgram, the remaining four nodular interstitial patterns cannot be reliably distinguished from each other morphologically on most chest x-rays. Take a look at these four chest x-ray images, and you can probably appreciate how difficult it would be to reliably distinguish these four nodular interstitial patterns apart from one another, especially when you don't control for disease severity. Because we're usually not able to use morphology to reliably distinguish or discern these four nodular interstitial patterns from each other on a chest x-ray, we frequently rely on other findings on the chest x-ray, um, on comparison images, and on patient history to narrow down the possible cause of a nodular interstitial pattern on chest x-ray, or, of course, by maybe doing a chest CT. Now, let's turn our attention to septal patterns of interstitial thickening. On a chest x-ray, the three-dimensional thick-walled polygons of the septal pattern may collapse into subtle lines that are discernible in some areas of a lung on a chest x-ray. Instead of polygons, we may see short one to two centimeter length, one to three millimeter thin horizontal lines near the periphery of the lung, typically at the lung bases and near the costophrenic angle, known as curly B lines. And we may see two to six centimeter length thin radiating lines extending from the hilum 
in the middle or upper lung zones, which shouldn't be confused with a minor fissure, and known as curly A lines. So on a chest x-ray, some cases of pulmonary edema, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, or alveolar proteinosis will get rendered as curly lines, which have a pretty characteristic appearance on a chest x-ray. The same cannot always be said about reticular versus nodular interstitial patterns, though. While you may be pretty confident that this patient has a reticular interstitial pattern, and this patient has a nodular interstitial pattern, what do you think about this patient? Or this patient? Or this patient? With coarse interstitial presentations on chest x-rays, it's pretty easy to recognize the presence of an abnormal interstitial opacity, but distinguishing whether it's reticular or nodular can sometimes be tough. With fine interstitial presentations, we tend to run into the opposite problem. While it may be easier to distinguish reticular patterns from nodular patterns with fine interstitial presentations, in real life, it's often difficult to tell whether you're looking at a real interstitial pattern or a pseudo interstitial pattern caused by imaging technique or noise. This brings me to my approach towards interstitial opacities on chest x-rays. If the interstitial opacity pattern are curly lines, you're probably dealing with pulmonary edema, unless there's something to make you also consider lymphangitic carcinomatosis too. If the interstitial opacity pattern is not curly lines and they appear coarse, you may be dealing with infectious bronchiolitis or one of the top four chronic causes of a coarse interstitial pattern, interstitial fibrosis, sarcoidosis, fibrotic HP, or a pneumoconiosis. If the interstitial opacities appear fine, and you're dealing with a portable chest x-ray, or the lungs are poorly inflated, or the image seems particularly grainy or noisy, the fine interstitial pattern you observe is indeterminate as there's a decent chance that what you're seeing is actually artifact. If the image quality is good and you're confident that the fine interstitial opacity pattern is a true lung finding, you'll try to determine whether the pattern is a reticular or a nodular interstitial pattern. Interstitial fibrosis, sarcoidosis, and fibrotic HP are usually going to be your top three answers for a reticular interstitial pattern. Infectious bronchiolitis, sarcoidosis, and pneumoconiosis are usually your top three answers for a nodular interstitial pattern. Nodules or masses represent a lump within the lung parenchyma. We use three centimeters as a size threshold for differentiating a nodule from a mass. There are four explanations for an apparent nodule or mass on a chest x-ray. The lung nodule or mass may represent a typical response to lung infection or irritation, or irritation. The lung nodule or mass may, on the other hand, represent an atypical proliferation of tissue. Some are congenital lesions or benign tumors that don't invade or metastasize, and some are malignant tumors that do invade or metastasize. Finally, there is the fourth and perhaps most common explanation, which is that what we're actually seeing is something like a nipple shadow, an overlapping or unusual rib shadow, a vascular shadow, a skin lesion, or a medical device, maybe a plastic chest port, for example, that's mimicking a lung nodule. As it turns out, chest x-rays aren't particularly specific at discriminating between these conditions we've highlighted here on this image here. Invariably, follow-up imaging of some sort, often CT, is required. While we like to think we're pretty good at something as basic as distinguishing a calcified granuloma from a non-calcified nodule, 
On one study, the average AUC of radiologists performing this task was only around 0.75 and did not appear to show any correlation with experience or subspecialty training. As a consequence, view chest x-rays as more of a screening modality rather than a, rather than a diagnostic modality for lung nodules, which actually substantially simplifies your task. One, try to catch as many unexpected lung nodules as possible on a chest x-ray, and two, don't get fooled by lung nodule mimics. That's it. Spotting lung nodules, though, is one of those skills that takes practice. If you're just getting started, you can give yourself a head start by knowing the most common blind spots for lung nodules on a chest x-ray. Let's start with these two lungs and plant five non-calcified nodules in them. They're pretty easy to spot right now, but after we start overlaying all the other anatomy that's on a chest x-ray besides the lungs, you can see how some of the nodules have become much more difficult to spot now, particularly if you had been looking for them prospectively. While this nodule is pretty easy to spot, nodules overlapping the cardiac silhouette. And nodules in the posterior basal lower lobes behind the diaphragmatic dome are notoriously easy to overlook without aggressive windowing and leveling. The same can also be said for nodules overlapping the first rib and medial clavicle and nodules overlapping the perihilar pulmonary vessels. When scanning for lung nodules and masses on a chest x-ray, be very careful within these blind spots. Slow down a little, window and level aggressively, and have a lower threshold for getting a chest CT if you're on the fence about something. Take this patient, for example. On the other hand, don't be fooled by pseudonodules created by hardware overlapping the lungs like this plastic chest port or this ventilator tube connector. Calluses from old rib fractures or nipple shadows. When you encounter an unexpected lung nodule on a chest x-ray, the first thing to do is to look at the patient's prior chest x-rays. If the nodule is one to three centimeters in size and prior chest x-rays demonstrate that it's new since four to six weeks ago, the nodule is most likely inflammatory or infectious. Ask for a repeat chest x-ray in four to six weeks to make sure it goes away with treatment. If prior chest x-rays demonstrate that the nodule has been stable for at least two years, the nodule is almost certainly benign. If neither situation applies, make sure you're not being fooled by a lung nodule mimic. If there's a possibility you may be actually dealing with a nipple shadow or a skin nodule, consider repeating the chest x-ray with nipple markers. If there's a possibility you may be actually dealing with something rib-related, consider bilateral oblique chest x-rays. And redo the projection that showed your perceived nodule, which is going to be typically a frontal view. If neither situation applies, obtain a chest CT. Since many perceived lung nodules are actually inflammatory and may disappear, we'll usually ask that the chest CT be done in a week rather than the same day. The lung vessels can be tricky to interpret on many chest x-rays because their appearance can be substantially influenced by external factors such as imaging technique and patient factors such as a poor inspiratory effort. 
Take, for example, these two chest x-rays, which were taken of the same patient only 60 minutes apart. Here's a closer look at the left lung. Notice how much the lung vessels seem enlarged on the shallow inspiratory image compared to the deep inspiratory image. As radiologists, we like to believe that we're pretty accurate at interpreting lung vessels on chest x-rays. However, when readers are asked to prospectively call finding such as cephalization and pulmonary vessel enlargement or congestion on inpatient chest x-rays and have their performance objectively assessed against clinical ground truth, it turns out that the accuracy of a majority of readers is in the ballpark of a coin flip. We can improve our performance a little if we confine calls of apparent pulmonary vascular congestion on chest x-rays to instances where either, one, the pulmonary vessels appear diffusely enlarged relative to a baseline comparison image with the same lung volumes and image quality, or two, the pulmonary vessels in the peripheral one centimeter of lung are visually discernible on chest x-ray. Here's a side-to-side -side comparison of a chest x-ray with pulmonary edema and a normal chest x-ray. If we mask everything but the peripheral one centimeter of lung in both images, you can see how the visibility of small peripheral pulmonary vessels on the pulmonary edema image compares with a normal image. Although these rules will help a little, you'll probably still need to incorporate more imaging signal, if you will, to diagnose pulmonary edema well on a chest x-ray. Consider calling pulmonary edema only in the presence of either symmetric diffuse bilateral consolidation or when any three of these other eight features is present on your patient's chest x-ray. Non-diffuse consolidation, diffuse indistinct interstitial opacities, curly lines, pulmonary vascular congestion, peribronchial cuffing, a dialysis catheter, and enlarged cardiac silhouette or bilateral pleural effusions. The five findings outlined in purple here are ones that are somewhat predictive for hydrostatic over capillary leak pulmonary edema. Let's wrap up this talk now with some pointers for how to report your interpretation of lungs on a chest x-ray. For over a century, journalists have been taught that any lead should answer the five fundamental questions of news writing, known as the five W's. Who, what, when, where, and why. As radiologists, we're reporters of a sort too, and this checklist applies to us as well. The first W is pretty self-evident when we're reporting a chest x-ray. So let's start with describing what feature did you see in the lung? The descriptor, the descriptor you'll use will most likely be one of the terms on this table with more specific descriptors as you shift right and less specific descriptors as you shift left. Sometimes you'll get an image like this one that will allow you to describe the feature as not only an opacity, but an interstitial opacity, and not only an interstitial opacity, but a reticular interstitial opacity pattern. On the other hand, you might sometimes get an image like this one, where there seems to be an opacity of some sort in the left lung here, but the image doesn't permit you to be confident as to whether if it's uh, interstitial opacity, consolidation, atelectasis, or more than one of these, obligating you to choose a much less specific descriptor. After describing what feature you see in the lung, move on to your next W. When. If you have a comparison study, try to share whether the finding is something that's new or something that's expanding over time or something that's shrinking over time or something that's remaining the same. If there's no comparison imaging, perhaps you can make an educated guess as to whether it's acute or perhaps you'll just have to confess that the time course is unclear. When you describe the chronicity of a finding, clearly establish the time frame. 
For example, is the finding unchanged relative to yesterday or relative to a year ago? The next W is where. If the finding is relatively focal, report its location. For chest X-ray reporting, I prefer to divide the lung cranial caudally into three main zones, upper lung, mid lung, and lower lung, with the term apical for features that hug the lung's superior margin and basilar for features that hug the lung's inferior margin. I prefer to divide the lung transversely into two zones, lateral and medial. So if I were to say see a lung nodule here, I'd describe it as a medial lower right lung nodule. If the feature you're describing is not particularly focal, describe its extent from focal to multifocal to diffuse. The final W is why. After you've described what the presenting imaging feature is, its chronicity and its location and extent Offer an educated guess as to its cause. Is the nodular interstitial pattern you see probably a lung infection? Or do you think pneumoconiosis is a more likely explanation? And if you're not sure, what's your differential diagnosis?